This power supply is an example of peak 2021 engineering. It's funny how something that seems so clever and futuristic in 2021 lost all its shine in 2022. It didn't stand up to the test of time and regular usage. I learned my lesson about being over smart from the discrete linear power supply project and wanted to go back to the bread and butter. Something based on the LM317 and LM337. Thanks to this request for advice from Giannis, I got a clue as to how this mysterious circuit from OnSemi's LM317 datasheet works. The JFETs pull a constant current, keeping the reference pin biased regardless of output voltage. I was ecstatic to learn that Falstad finally included an LM317 model which works, kind of. Maybe the model needs a little more refining. LM317s are cheap and plentiful. LM337s on the other hand seem virtually unheard of and when I got my hands on some, they turned out to be fakes. America seems to be the only source of these elusive chips. I asked both my American friends, the skirt bearer and the train pirate, but responses were mixed and I'm still waiting for my LM337s. My saviour was again an unlikely source, Adam from Slovakia who sent me some of his linear power supply boats. Not the nicest looking things, but they were sent my way with a lot of guarantees. The schematic? Well, I don't understand much of it either, but it reminds me of this Elector magazine article from December 1982. It goes into a lot of depth explaining this power supply, once again saving me an explanation. If you noticed, a separate isolated power supply is needed to power the control section. Normally I would have complained about this, but this time I relented. Isolated converters are cheap. Kind of. First, component placement. This was easier said than done since the component values, reference designators and placement were in separate documents. With a little change of place, I was able to get it done. A smart friend of mine once told me that if an event has two outcomes, it does not mean they are equally probable. And in this case, I would place my bets on this thing blowing up. And it did. The 741 op amp is burning hot and it took the expensive isolated converter with it. Turns out the emitter and collector silk screen on the output transistor footprint are switched. After switching the leads and replacing the fried converter, I have a reasonable voltage and current on the output, although not very accurate. This can be fixed using one of the many trimmers on this board. And now the current limit is scratchy. I'll just attribute that to poor soldering and cheap pots. Another problem is that the current limit does not start from zero. We had to fix that using some bodges. This time, I decided to ditch the ATX form factor and go for something more orange. I also took some time to get the wiring right. Using a two-winding mains transformer would have been the more conventional route, but isolated power bricks are more compact and efficient. The case is designed to be three interlocking parts, the back with the mains converters, the middle that houses the PCBs and the front panel. The middle case had to be turned into a pen stand because the heatsink I had planned to use was a little too small and poorly done. I decided to go with this one used in the previous supply till a custom one turns up. The wiring is not as neat as I would have liked, but it is adequate. Turns out silicone insulation turns into ash if burnt. The front panel meter was cannibalized from the old supply. The panel itself went through several iterations before I decided on this one. I could have done a better job with the case since nothing prevents the segments from separating. I ended up super gluing the rear and taping the front, but it's still not ideal. Adam particularly wanted me to test how well the supply responded to load transients. To do this, I made a MOSFET current sink based on a circuit from the Art of Electronics the X chapters, but I seem to have gotten some of the details wrong. And changing the gate driver supply voltage does not do much to change load current. Connecting it to the supply shows some interesting results. The current limit hits hard and recovery response is slow. But then again, this is not designed to be a fast supply that would take some more cost and complexity. The next most important parameter is noise. And to measure it, I will be using something that I'll talk about in a future video. 200 microvolts peak to peak is quite a reasonable amount compared to the several hundreds of millivolts that switcher outputs are known for. Aluminium was my original choice of metal, but I got cornered into a deal to make the heatsink out of copper. Not that it's a bad choice, copper is twice as thermally conductive as aluminium. I ended up spending a small fortune on these, but luckily one of them fits perfectly. Shout out to White Rose from the IMKC Discord for making these. 
he is more than glad to offer cnc and manufacturing services for any material from my experience with the rail gun copper tarnishes very fast in the smoky humid indian climate i don't think i have a bath large enough to nickel plate this heat sink so a more feminine solution is in order a rough coat of clear nail polish smoothed using the acetone in nail polish remover provides a durable conformal coating the insides get a different treatment with heat sink compound and that concludes this little power supply build thanks again to adam for providing me with these boards and helping me make a power supply that actually works as intended